morning, friends. Um, today is the last Sunday of the church year, and the last 1,000 years or so, the church uh, designated today the Festival of Christ the King. So we crown the year by crowning the King. This morning we remember that Jesus is the Davidic King. He is in the line of King David. He is descended from David. He is the Shepherd King. He is the Suffering King who lays down his life for his subjects. And he is the Messianic King. He is God incarnate, the Most High, who comes into our world to be our Saviour and our friend. Would you please stand as we celebrate Christ the King. I also must apologise that I'm getting old, and as a result, I've forgotten my help. So, I'm feeling very cool, literally. <laughs> so, I really apologise. Um, I'm not robed. But Matt is robed, so he's making us look good. The Lord be with you. Let us sing our opening hymn, Come All You Weary, for God So Love. Let's pray the Lord. Celebration of Christ the King. 
Jesus revealed to us that God is love, and that the King of kings is the Lord of love. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Isn't that a beautiful uh, rendition of uh, that, that painting, the light of the world in Canterbury Cathedral, the face of Jesus? Let us greet one another and say good morning and welcome. Christ is King. Lovely to see you here today. Okay, uh, <laughs> to come in this morning and to find um, a full car park. When I came, I couldn't find a parking space, and that's wonderful. I'm really happy about that. Um, it's a kind of a trick, you know, we, we have the nativity play to get everybody here on time. So everyone's bringing the kids for the rehearsal, and everybody's here on for practices. Uh, and I'm so happy to come into a full car park on this beautiful blue sky day. I'd like to wish a happy Thanksgiving this week to all of the Americanos. If you're an American, North American, happy Thanksgiving, Mary. Um, John was at 9 o'clock this morning with Johnny. And I'd also like to wish a very happy birthday to Daniel oh, this morning. Lovely to have Daniel here. Wish him a very happy birthday this morning. If anyone else is happy, having a birthday, we also wish you happy birthday. As we come to sing our praises to Christ the King, let us pray this prayer for pure hearts together as we do, saying, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's praise the Lord as we sing, Water You Turn Into Wine.
loosen your heart. Just tell him that you love him. Just worship him. Speak it out loud. Speak it out loud. We worship you. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Our Savior and our friend. Thank you for saving us, Lord. Thank you for always being with us, Lord. Thank you that you never leave us or forsake us. We love you, Jesus, King of Kings. Lord, that this morning we ask that you will truly be the King of our hearts and lives. We confess and repent of those times when we have lifted up other thrones and we have worshipped other gods and we have put others in your place, including even ourselves. Have mercy on us, Lord, as we come before your throne, King of Kings, this morning. We confess our need of you, and we are sorry for the times we have raised up other gods and other thrones. And we ask, Lord, that we may truly be strengthened, that we may, with our will and our life and our heart and soul and mind and strength, put you as in first place in our hearts and lives, above all others, all other loyalties, all other crowns, all other thrones. You alone are worthy of our praise. King of kings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. I invite you to join in the part in yellow in today's theme prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth divided and enslaved by sin, may be free and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated, dear friends, for the first reading. For those of you who have come in late, I apologize that I'm getting old and I have foggy brain all the time now, so I left my alb at home today, and I'm feeling very cool. It's very nice. Our first reading this morning from the prophet Jeremiah is read to us by Haley Chow. Welcome, Haley. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 to 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep in my pastures, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock, and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnants of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold. And they shall be fruitful and my path. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall fear not longer, any longer, or they be dismayed. Nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be safe, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which shall be called the Lord our righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is a wonderful reading, boys and girls. It's, it's, it's written by the prophet Jeremiah to Israel hundreds of years before Jesus. And in the reading that Haley read to us beautifully just now, uh, Jeremiah takes the kings of Israel to task and the leaders, the, the high priests, because they haven't been good shepherds and they have taken advantage of the people and divided the people. And Jeremiah speaks for God. And the Lord says to Jeremiah, I'm going to raise up a good shepherd who will be the king of my people and he will unite the people and he will bring righteousness and salvation to the people and he prophesies that this coming king is going to be a descendant of King David so we have one of these messianic prophecies from the Old Testament that tells us of the coming of the king now normally we say one of the Psalms at this point but today we have something special instead of the Psalms which are the songs of the Old Testament we have a song from the New Testament there are other songs in the Bible other than the Psalms. And we call the other songs canticles, which just means a song. And today, it's the song of a man called Zechariah. Now, Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist, 
who was the forerunner of Jesus. He was the one who came to announce Jesus. <clears throat> you know when you see those movies about kings and queens in the old days, and when someone important comes to the door, somebody will announce, this is the king of wherever, or this is the duke of so-and-so. Well, John the Baptist, he was the forerunner who came to announce the coming of the king, the Messiah. And his father, Zechariah, when John the Baptist was born, had this prophecy. So, we have a wild man. I think he might be going to be like John the Baptist. He'll, he'll be a wild man in the desert. He's escaping from his mother. Could some ladies help, please? Ah, experienced hands. Thank you. I think Dad's not here today. So, fathers, can you help with that when the time comes, please? Don't leave poor old mum to struggle on her own. Thank you, Yeti, for stepping up. Um, when you see a child there um, driving his mum crazy, step in and help her mum. <laughs> Always a good idea. <laughs> All right, let's turn to page two, guys. Song of Zechariah. And in this song, Zechariah identifies that his son, John, is going to be the forerunner. Because the Old Testament prophesied that there would be a forerunner who would come before the Messiah. And John says, this boy of mine, he's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Now, let's say this from side to side of the church. And we're going to say it by whole, whole verses beginning on this side. So, Miss Anna, can you pick up your microphone and lead on that side? Thank you. So let's begin on this side. We say together the Song of Zechariah. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. That he would save us from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. So now we're going to have the epistle reading, which is by Johan. Welcome back, Johan. It's lovely to have you with us. And as he comes, I'm going to introduce it, just to explain. This uh, letter to Colossi, the Colossians, is written to the smallest city that Paul wrote to. Come and join me, brother. I'll just introduce it, so you understand it. Colossae was the smallest city, but this is possibly the most important letter that Paul wrote, even more important than Corinthians and Ephesians and those other letters. And the reason was he's addressing a heresy in Colossae. Colossae was very influential, small but dangerous. And the Colossians believed in a heresy called Gnosticism. Gnosticism taught that there was a secret knowledge about Jesus that only they knew, and that if people knew the secret knowledge, they would be saved. And in their secret knowledge, it had two points particularly. One point was, Jesus was not really human. That he was like a messenger, an emanation from God. They use the word emanation, which means something that comes out of God, but is not God. So the first point is, they said, Jesus is not really human. The second point, they said, is Jesus is not really God, because he's an emanation from God. So this was a her heresy. Heresy means not true. <coughs> Excuse me. So these guys, and it was kind of a secret religion. A lot of them were Jewish. It was a mix of Jews and Gentiles. And they had a lot of Jewish rituals, and they had secret rituals, and they would go into caves and do goodness knows what. Um, and they were proposing this idea, or selling this idea, and confusing the early Christians. So boys and girls, listen carefully to Johann's reading. And listen to when it tells us that Jesus is God, and that Jesus is human. Listen for those two points in this reading that Johann's going to read. When does it say Jesus is God and Jesus is fully human? Okay? Listen carefully. Thank you and welcome back, Ronnie. 
Sorry for the long intro. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, the epistle reading from Colossians 1, verse 11 to 20. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from His glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in Him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He Himself is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, God. You notice that he mentions the blood of the cross. That tells us that Jesus is human. He's been put to death on the cross. But there are also all these other wonderful descriptions of how Jesus is the creator of the world. And he has the fullness of God. He is fully God. So this is a very important passage. And it possibly saved the church. Now when Paul wrote this, he didn't know he was writing something that we would be reading in 2,000 years. He just thought he was writing to a confused group of Christians in a little city. But it turned out that this letter to that little confused group of Christians has been very important for us to help us to understand our faith. Now we're going to stand and sing a lovely song for Christ the King. When you, when you meet the Queen or the King, you say, Your Majesty, that's the, how you address them. If you, meet, if you would have met Queen Elizabeth, you would have called her Your Majesty, Queen Elizabeth. So we're going to sing to the King this morning, King Jesus, Majesty, worship His Majesty. Worship His Majesty unto Jesus be glory, honor, and praise. Majesty
according to St. Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse 33. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now when they came to the place that is called Golgotha, or the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. He is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was also an inscription over him which read, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Dear friends, our next Sunday is the Friendship Sunday, and so do please bring your friends along. Uh, we will have testimony and uh, church lunch together. It's not communion, uh, but we will eat together and have our love. Uh, the early Christians called it a love feast when you have lunch instead of communion. It's a love feast, an agape meal. So we will enjoy our meal together. And we are trying a new caterer, as I mentioned. So do please invite your friends to come along and come and hear the testimony next Sunday. Friendship Sunday. Also, um, I just want to again keep reminding friends to sign up for the church lunch on the 18th of December. Remember there is no service here, no service here on the 18th of December. Um, there's no 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock service. Instead, we will have a combined parish service at 10 a.m. at the Artisan Grand Lapa on the 18th of December, 10 a.m. service. Um, so go there. The service is free. Everybody is welcome. And then after church, we will have our Sunday school um, church family games on the basketball court, as we did before. And at 1 o'clock, and we'll have, a, we'll have a, also a photograph, a church family photograph. And at 1 p.m., we will have Christmas lunch. It's the Sunday before Christmas, but we will have Christmas lunch together. And St. Nicholas is coming to visit us. We have a very special St. Nicholas from Africa this year. Do you know St. Nicholas was the Bishop of Myra in North Africa? And so St. Nick is coming from Africa this, this year to uh, visit us. And he has a couple of reindeer with him, apparently. I don't know how the reindeer got to Africa, but, you know, who knows? St. Nick can do anything, right? So... We have um, 200 places or so, but 137 have already been filled. So um, whatever that leaves, we have um, 65 or so places left. So do please sign up. 
Now, as of next week, I'm going to give opportunity for you to sign up your friends. So today is the last Sunday to, for our congregation to sign up. And then after that, if you want to bring friends, you can sign up friends. You must sign up because there's a specific number of places for the lunch. I can't emphasize how much this is a good deal. You're going to get a five-star lunch for a very cheap price. It'll be a wonderful Christmas lunch, I promise you. And um, it'll be a wonderful occasion. We'll be celebrating the 200th anniversary. And you'll also receive a gift of our 200th anniversary mug. No one else in the world will have it. From Morrison Chapel. We are the, the first Protestant Christian Church of Asia. And so we're going to celebrate that together. Um, so do please uh, sign up this morning and pay a deposit or pay your money to Miss Lucy and friends at the table. Please don't miss out. I don't want anybody to miss out. All right, um, now Christmas is coming soon. Next Sunday is Advent 1. And if anyone can perform Christmas music, so if you play an instrument skillfully, or you can sing a duet, or you can do what would be nice would be a, tr a, a trio, you know, like piano and violin and oboe or something like whatever. But uh, if you play an instrument, um, maybe you could prepare something for one of the Christmas services and let me know, preferably a carol, must be, yes. We don't want Love Me Tender for Christmas, sorry. Uh, so, so prepare a Christmas music or carol, uh, if you can, and let me know. We'd like to have... Now, this is both for the chapel and also for here. So it could be on the Nativity service or it could be on Christmas Day. Let me see what you're offering and I'll try to put it in the right place um, on the right occasion, depending on how long you need to practice. So if anybody can help with that, it would be nice to have some special Christmas music other than the carols that we all sing. Gosh, the ki kids are excited this morning, aren't they? Each Sunday after this service, we have a, a prayer ministry time uh, over here, and we've forgotten to put the seats out. So, um, uh, Matt, why don't you do it now? Can you grab just five or six chairs? Here, they're here, bro, in the front. Get these five, four chairs and put them over there. So if you'd like prayer for anything, you can go to these chairs and um, someone, Lani or, or, or Jolene or somebody from the Wednesday group, sorry guys, you're suddenly in the front row. <laughs> um, somebody will, will pray for you. All right. Best laid plans of mice and men sometimes go astray. Now, we have an announcement. This car is blocking a teacher. Okay, so some of the cars in the basement are teachers. They're not all with the church. So there's a car, MZ. 8627. Who owns MZ8627? Anybody? MZ, thank you. Sorry, you need to move the car. The teacher is trying to get out. Yeah, when you park, please don't block, t please don't block cars in. <coughs> Find a spot along the runway, along the driveway, <coughs> when you're not blocking anybody. The cars could be teachers' cars. Um, even on Sunday, some teachers come into work. If you really can't get a spot, I'm sorry you have to park outside. Please don't double park in the basement. It's dangerous um, and it's not right. So um, if you can't get a parking spot, come to church earlier. Sorry. Um, and also, if you're bringing friends, tell them, tell your friends next week. To come. By the way, that's a point. For Friendship Sunday, if you're a regular member, it would be really handy if you can park outside next Sunday. Even if five or six of us could park out, it will make some more space. I think Dominic knows where to park. There's some car park near here, isn't there, Don? Is there a car park nearby? Nearby. So if you want to know a close by car park, see Dominic. Uh, Carmen researched it when she was here. So if you want to know, because some of us next Sunday, we shouldn't park in the basement to make room for visitors. We want, on Friendship Sunday, we want the visitors to be able to find a car park. So if you're regularly a member of our church, uh, please talk to Dominic, find out where to park. You can park somewhere else uh, next Sunday maybe. But do come. We want you to come. Or find a park along the street or somewhere. If the church grows, you know, we're going to have this problem. And as Christians, we need to make room for the visitors, for the newcomers, for our, our regular members, make room for others. Now, lastly, before we go to Sunday school, um, I believe that the only reason for giving in the offering is because you love God and you're thankful. I always say, if you don't love God, don't give. 
Um, the only, the only right reason for giving money to the church is out of thanksgiving and love for God and also obedience to the scripture. The scriptures tell us to give generously and regularly to the ministry of, of God's church. So don't give under compulsion. Don't give to meet a budget. Don't give because we need a piano or something. But give because God has moved you in your heart because you love Christ and you want to express your thanks and you want to be obedient to God's word. It is part of Christian discipline to give and I need to talk about that another time. However, I need to let you know that as of this last month, we are $100,000 in the red this year. Now that's happened for two reasons. One is we've increased our giving to support the denomination, the diocese. Because for 15 years, the denomination has been supporting us. They've been helping pay my salary. They've been helping run our church. So we decided last year on the church council to give back the full amount, to pay the full commitment of what it costs to employ the staff, to help with the diocesan, the running of the diocesan office, our management office that does our admin and so on. And um, so we have increased our giving. But also this year, we had several months with no offering. So as a result of that, our giving is, is down. Now, we're not anxious, we're not afraid, because in past years, the Lord has provided a surplus. So during the fat years, the Lord has given us a surplus and we can last for several years, a bit like Macau. So, however, ideally, we want to balance the budget, you understand. Now, many of you are struggling, your businesses are struggling, you can't, you, you can just barely break even. I, I'm not asking you to give blood from a stone. But I, and many of us are on low income. However, there are many of us who are on professional salaries that we've had no drop, like me, we've had no drop in income, we're well supported by our employers, and we're in a position to give more. So if you can help us to balance the budget this year, that would be wonderful if you can make a special offering. If you can't, don't worry, the Lord will provide. But I would just challenge those of you who are on steady incomes and you're able to help, you're in a position to help, please consider if you can make a special offering before the end of December so we can at least try to balance the budget. But like I say, it's, it's not a big deal. We can last for several years at this rate. So um, it's just good bookkeeping. We want to balance the budget. So if you, and if you can help, if the Lord moves you, please, please do so. Um, so I hope that's okay. At very least, I should make you aware that we're going down each month. Now, this has never happened before in the church's history, but also our commitment has never been so strong. We've never been giving so strongly and paying all our bills. We've always been a mission church. I don't know if you know that, but the last, the last uh, 15 years that I've been here, we've been a mission church. That means we've been subsidized. We're all here because the Tsingungwe subsidized the church and made it possible for the church to be here. So the church council decided this is our time to give back. So by faith, we are trying to do that. So I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, our church treasurer is here. Angel, where are you, Angel? Angel is here with Charlotte. So if you have any questions, ask Charlotte. If Charlotte doesn't know the answer, ask Mummy. Okay, she'll know the answer. Okay. All right, uh, let's stand and join hands. Please read the notices. Take them home and read them, study them, pray about them. And let us join hands as we go to Sunday school. Our Sunday school teachers, you, you're going to have an extra eight minutes, okay? Let's say ten minutes, ten more minutes for Sunday school. So come back at 12.40, Go in peace, go in joy. Uh, teachers come back at 12.40, 12.40, extra 10 minutes. As you trust Him, He walk in me this way. Please be seated. We we'll give them a moment to go out.
I always feel like this must be like the great exodus of Egypt. Let us pray. Actually, I'm, John, I'm going to take off the headset now. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord, um, we thank you for this day that you've made. We thank you that you are the king of our hearts. We thank you that you have revealed to us what God is like when the world did not know who you were. By revelation, you came to us and revealed yourself to us. We ask that we would be like you, that we would be people of love and service and sacrifice to others. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we have a buffet of great readings, as I've indicated. The, the prophecy of Jeremiah about the Davidic messianic king. The beautiful canticle song of Zechariah, foretelling that his son, little John, little Johnny, would be John the Baptist, the great forerunner of the Messiah. The amazing epistle to Colossians. My goodness, we could do a whole weekend on Colossians. That would be, that would be wonderful, uh, the background to it. It's, it's a fascinating and wonderful town and a fascinating and wonderful history and epistle addressing the problem of the heresy of Gnosticism in, in Colossae um, and its affirmation of the humanity and the divinity of Christ, that he was not some emanation or creation of God, but that he was the human-born son of God incarnate. Or oh, this amazing and beautiful gospel this morning, the gospel from Luke of the crucifixion of Jesus, of the King. Jesus was put to death on the charge of claiming to be a king, which was a charge of sedition, of treason. That was the pretext of his execution by the Romans, treason. He claimed to be the king of the Jews. And truly he did identify himself as the messianic king of Israel, but of course what they didn't understand as we do in retrospect, that he came to be the king of hearts. And that the enemies that he came to fight, <coughs> I don't know if Zechariah understood this or not, but the enemies he came to fight. Zechariah keeps mentioning his enemies. It sounds slightly paranoid. He has come to save us from our enemies. He swore to our father Abraham he would set us free from the hand of our enemies. I don't know if Zechariah realized that the enemies he came to set us free from were evil, Satan, and sin, and death. These are the old enemies. Maybe Zechariah thought it was the enemies of the Roman Empire or the Gentile nations around them. But of course we know with hindsight that he came to be the king of hearts and to set us free from the enemies of the spirit of Satan, sin and death. And in this uh, gospel reading this morning we have this beautiful uh, moving exchange between the two thieves on the cross. The one who mocks Jesus together with the crowd, the soldiers, the high priests, they mock him. What sort of king are you letting yourself be crucified? And the one person who defends him is his fellow thief uh, sorry, a fellow cr a criminal is being crucified with him, uh, the thief next to him, who says, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. A, remarkable, a remarkably gracious thing to say. What that thief knew or understood, I don't know. Had he heard Jesus preach? Had he seen Jesus raise the dead? Was he there when Jesus turned water into wine? Had he seen the miracles and the deliverance of demon demonized people? Had he seen the lame walk and the blind sea? Had he heard the beautiful words of the Sermon on the Mount? We don't know. Had, did he understand, like Peter, that Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God? Had he understood that? In his sinfulness, did he know, did he understand that Jesus was the Messiah? Or was he just being gracious? Was he just being kind to a fellow condemned man? I feel it's more than that. What a thing to say to someone being crucified next to you. Remember me when you come in your kingdom. I mean, there's not much time left, is there? If you're going to come down off the cross and defeat the Romans and establish a new kingdom, you know, you better get busy because we're dying here on the cross. But it doesn't seem to have the spirit of that, does it? He doesn't seem to be saying something like that. It seems that he's understood, to me, that he's understood that Jesus' kingdom is other than this world, 
that somehow, at least it seems to me, he understands Jesus as the messianic king. And Jesus responds with these beautiful words. As the first, you can say, the first convert slips into, into the kingdom of God, into paradise with Jesus. Today you will be with me in paradise. Why? Because he has, has faith. He's expressed faith. He's believed in Jesus as the king of kings, the Messiah, the, the God-made man. He's the Messiah was God made man, Emmanuel, God with us. It's clear in the scriptures. The son of man of Daniel is the one who will be God incarnate, who will establish a kingdom that will never end. Jews understood this. They all knew it. Daniel was being read like we read Harry Potter. They were reading Daniel in the first century. They all knew who the son of man was. They all knew who the Messiah was. And he says, remember me, Messiah, when you come in your kingdom. Today you will be with me in paradise. Beautiful readings. Which of these amazing, amazing readings shall we preach on? Well, um, I want to preach to you about the canticle, the song of Zechariah. And um, it's, a, it's a beautiful song that he sings. Um, and the, the verse before, if you look at your bulletin on page 2, you have the song of Zechariah. But let me read you the verse that precedes it. Verse 67. Your, your, your reading starts with verse 68. But in verse 67... Luke writes this, the child's father, Zechariah. Now, Zechariah was a priest, and it was uh, his temple, his turn to be in the temple. And um, you remember the story that he was told by an angel that he would have a son who would be the forerunner of, of, G of the Messiah, of Jesus. And um, he, he doesn't really believe it, and he's struck dumb. So from the time when he encounters the angel in the temple, he is dumb until the, the baby is born. And, you know, when, they, when the baby is born, they want to ask the father, what will you name the, the baby? And he indicates for them to bring writing material, and he writes, his name is John. And John means, I think, means gift of God. I'm not sure, gift of God, I think it is. And from that point, his mouth is opened. And then he's able to, and he, he's, he sings this prophecy apparently. And it says his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. So he, he receives the baby, John, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesies this prophecy. And he begins as many Hebrew prayers did by blessing God. He says, blessed be the God of Israel who has come to his people and set them free. So in other words, he's saying with this child, God is beginning to come. This is about the coming, the advent of the, the Savior to set people free. He, he cuts to the chase. God has raised up for us a mighty Savior. Not, not his baby John, but his baby John is going to be the forerunner, as you'll hear. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, uh, Jesus, who hasn't come yet, but he's coming, born of the house of his servant David, through the holy prophets that were promised of old. He would save us from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us. Like I say, maybe, maybe Zechariah thought that was the Romans, and we don't really know. But we know that it's the enemies of Satan, sin, and death. So he promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This is God. And this is the promise, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies. Free to worship God without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. This is how they imagine heaven. They imagine the kingdom of God. Um, when the Messiah would rule, that they would have freedom of worship, that they could freely worship the Messianic King um, and worship God uh, together. Worship Him, you notice, Him without fear uh, all the days of our life. And then he speaks to the baby, his baby, his son John. And he says, you, my child, little Johnny, you will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare His way to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. For in the tender compassion of our God, the dawn, the light dawning from on high <coughs> shall break upon us to shine on those who dwelt in darkness and the shadow of death. You remember last week we talked about Yom Yahweh and how the coming of the Lord um, would be a watershed in history where there would be darkness and judgment, the wrath of God would fall on the sinful nations of the world. But here, the Messiah comes to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Peace is shalom, all the blessings of God in our life. 
Now, I want to talk to you about this prophetic song because I believe that it contains within it a pattern for Christian life. It's describing the ministry of John and Jesus. Zechariah is saying what John and Jesus will do. But in doing that, he gives us a pattern for our Christian life and for Christian evangelism and growth. Let me explain. So, um, and at the end, the last verse, it says, The child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly. So he lived out in the wilderness until he came to begin his ministry. Now, Zechariah has this vision for his son, John, and he thinks of his son as the prophet and the forerunner who will prepare the way for the Messiah. All devout Jews in those days hoped and longed for the day when the Messiah would come. One of the Old Testament prophets, Micah, says, don't long for the day of the Lord. You remember I quoted that to you last week. He says, don't long for the coming of the Lord, because Yom Yahweh will be a day of darkness and of judgment. And as I said to you, I believe that was fulfilled on the cross, when the darkness covered the land and the judgment of God fell on himself uh, as he hung on the cross, on his incarnate self, Jesus. But at the time of Jesus, most uh, Jews believed that before the Messiah came, a forerunner would announce the coming of the Messiah and prepare the way and the hearts of the people to receive the Messiah. And in the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verse 5, it gives us a clue about who this forerunner is. In Malachi 4, 5, it says, Look, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Now, you know, I've said to you before, when, you, when we read the scripture, we always need to try to ask the question, is this meant literally or metaphorically? And the answer is always a little bit of both. In the Bible, there are things that are literal and there are things that are metaphorical, and there are things that are mostly literal but a little bit metaphorical, and there are things that are mostly metaphorical but a little bit literal. Now, this is uh, one of those things that is metaphorical but a little bit literal. It says, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. So some Jews thought that Elijah the prophet would be raised from the dead or reincarnated and that he would be the actual forerunner of the Messiah. But now there's a problem with that. In Judeo-Christian understanding, God doesn't raise dead people from the past to bring messages to the present. He does raise Jesus, but that's a different thing. He raises Jesus eternally. Jesus has risen and he's still alive. He's still risen in, in, in incarnate. He's still risen in the flesh. Uh, and he is both physical and spiritual, we believe. Um, so it, it didn't get raised and then die later on. It's the Christian understanding. So in the Judeo-Christian understanding, God doesn't like raise up you know, King Henry from the past or you know, King Arthur or whatever it is to come and give us a message and then he dies again and goes away again. That doesn't happen because once you're dead, you're, you're dead, right? Except, of course, as Christians, we believe that ultimately in the last days when the Messiah comes again, there'll be a resurrection of the dead and the new heaven and new earth, but that's a different thing. In the current age in which we live, uh, people are not generally raised. Um, I need to be careful here because God can do anything. And there are, of course, many stories in the modern era of people be coming back from the dead and Jesus raising people from the dead. But in general, it's not a way that God uses. Uh, and also, of course, they were believing that he would be sort of the reincarnation. Uh, and we don't believe in that way in reincarnation. We don't believe that that the dead are reincarnated or raised in that way. So um, maybe somebody might have a, a death experience or a near-death experience and be raised from the dead. I've heard of miracles like that. But we don't have in the Judeo-Christian tradition people coming back from 500 years ago, 700 years ago to bring a message. So it just doesn't fit with how God works in the Old Testament. God may raise the widow's son, um, at Nain, or he, he may raise um, Lazarus, uh, but it's kind of immediate within a couple of days, and it's a miracle to demonstrate a point. Um, and in the Old Testament, there are examples of people being raised from the dead. Indeed, Elijah raised a boy from the, Sh is it, uh, I forgot her name, is it the Shunammite woman's child from the dead. 
Um, so there are examples of that, but it's immediate. It's not like 500 years later. So this idea of God bringing Elijah back from the dead doesn't fit the Judeo-Christian understanding of how God works. So it doesn't seem reasonable to say that God is going to reincarnate or raise Elijah from the dead and bring him back. So then what does it mean? Well, it's, it's metaphorical. And so Jesus later identifies John as one having the spirit of Elijah, that he is in a sense Elijah. Now, why Elijah? Well, Elijah is the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Um, he, is, he is the great prophet of the Old Testament. So when the transfiguration took place, you remember, Jesus appears transfigured with the glory, the light of God shining through him with Moses and Elijah. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets, which is the scripture or most of the Old Testament scripture. So it's the full revelation of God, the law and the prophets. So Elijah is kind of the quintessential prophet. He is symbolic of the prophetic ministry. Uh, and he is also the most powerful of the prophets. He does the greatest wonders and miracles. Now, John the Baptist is considered the greatest Old Testament prophet and the first New Testament prophet because he comes at the watershed between the Old and New Testament. So John, in a way, eclipses Elijah. He fulfills the ministry of Elijah because as an Old Testament prophet, and he was an Old Testament prophet, like in the way he lived out in the desert and he wore camel's hair and ate locusts and wild honey. You know, he was a sort of wild prophet living out in the cave in the desert. That's kind of Old Testament prophetic idea. So he kind of fit the model of an Old Testament prophet, except he doesn't do miracles. He has one role, and that is to bring the message that the Messiah is coming. He's the forerunner, the messenger of, of Christ. So I think it's reasonable to interpret Malachi metaphorically, that God is saying... Before I will send you, metaphorically, someone with the spirit of the prophet Elijah. So he represents the prophets. He brings the word of God, the message of God. And the word is, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, so that's the whole message. This is the Lamb of God. The Lamb means he's going to be the sacrifice of God for our sin. And he's going to take away the sin of the world. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit with fire. So this is the dual testimony of John. Jesus is the Lamb whose blood will take away our sin, and he's the one who brings the fire of the Spirit into our lives to strengthen us and ordain us in Christian ministry. He's the baptizer with fire. So um, they had this expectation that there would be the forerunner. And Zechariah, you might say presumptuously, but is under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He is singing and speaking prophetically in his song, and he says, You, my child will be called the prophet of the Most High. In other words, he's claiming the prophecy of Malachi on his son John. He's saying, this boy of mine, this is the one. He is the forerunner. He is the fulfillment of Malachi. He is the one who brings the prophecy uh, to, to life. And you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. Now, Christ is not only our coming as our king, but our example. So I want to share with you four points. This is a four-point sermon. So, so far, it's all introduction, okay? And I want to share with you four things. Uh, it's, they're pretty simple. Today is a kind of simple sermon, really. Four things in Zechariah's song that tell us about Christian life. In, in introducing to us his son, the forerunner, and the Messiah, Zechariah tells us something about a pattern, which is also true for us. Indeed, as we come to the end of the church year, the church year is all about following the pattern of Jesus. The church year, we remember that Jesus is born of the Spirit. We too need to be born of the Spirit. Jesus is baptized with the baptism of death for our sins. We too need to be baptized into the waters of death for the forgiveness of our sin. Jesus is raised from the dead on Easter Sunday. We too need to be raised from the waters of baptism by faith to eternal life with Christ. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit upon the early church. We too need to be filled, baptized and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus commissions and sends out the early church in the Great Commission. Go into all the world, make disciples of all nations. We too are commissioned. And then we read through all the miracles and the teaching and the healing of Jesus throughout the year. So the church year is our model. It, we follow Jesus. It's all about Jesus. 
The church here, the readings every Sunday, so important to come to church, hear the readings, because almost without realizing, we are being soaked in the story of the life of Christ, Sunday by Sunday. And we are understanding that this is our story. It's his story, but it's our story. We follow in his footsteps. He is our pattern and our example. The Christmas carol, you know, says he is our childhood pattern. Well, he's not just our childhood pattern, he's our whole life pattern. So this morning I want to show you how embedded, embedded in Zechariah's song is our life pattern. Okay? All right. First point, there are four points. First point is there is a preparation. If you have your bulletin here, keep it open on page two. Um, you, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. Now, who is preparing the way? John. But who is preparing the way? The Lord. Who sends John? It's the Lord. Who sends the prophecy to the lips of Zechariah? It's the Lord. Who ordains that John the Baptist will come and be the forerunner? It's the Lord. The Lord is preparing the way by sending John to prepare the way, to prepare the hearts. And what does John do? How does he tell people to prepare? What does he say? Other than this is Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What does he say before that? Repent. He calls the people. Next Sunday, we're going to begin Advent Sunday with the great call from God's spell. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. This is the cry of John the Baptist. How are they to, re to re prepare the way? By repenting of their sin. By having baptism for the washing away of sin. This is John's baptism. It's not Christian baptism. Christian baptism is for the washing away of sin <clears throat> and into Christ's death and resurrection. There's an extra bit added. John called them <clears throat> to prepare the way through repentance. Who does the preparation? John. But who really does the preparation? God. God is sending John. God is sending John with a message. Prepare. Repent. You know, rend your hearts. And the people went out to hear him. And they were moved. And they did. They were excited. The Messiah is coming. And they got baptized in droves. And then Jesus comes. And he also wants to be baptized. And John says, you, do you come to me for baptism? I, you know, I'm not worthy to untie your sandals. I'm not worthy to, to baptize you. And then Jesus tells him, John, this must be done to fulfill all righteousness. For surely he is baptized into our sins that we might have our sins washed away. He dies our death. He is our example for us to follow. So the first thing is there's preparation. Do you know all of our life is a preparation to know Christ and to serve Christ? This is the first point. God has been preparing you all your life. You know, there's a beautiful song. Um, there's a country song. God bless the broken road. You know that song? God bless the broken road that, that brought me back to you. I love that song. It's so, so touching. And it says, you know, all of those relationships, all of those broken hearts, they were like northern lights that led me to you, to the one that I love, led me to my true love. And all of that heartbreak and all of the struggle and the pain that the singer has gone through, they were all to prepare me. This is a Christian idea. It's the idea that God is using the experiences of life to prepare us for what he is calling us to do. I believe when I look back over my life, that all my life God was preparing me to be an international missionary priest here for you in Macau. I believe that. I believe that before your children were conceived, before many of you were even born, God called me and prepared my life to be here, to be your pastor for this season for a purpose, so that some of you might come to faith and find salvation and grow in Christ. God did that decades before you were born, before you even imagined anything about God. God is preparing you for the ministry that you have in the future, and he has prepared you in the past. So all the disappointments that you go through, the sins that you commit, the mistakes that you make, the bad things that you happen to you, God is using them to prepare you for the ministries that he's calling you to in the future. The thing is to open your eyes and to say, here I am, Lord. I'm ready to serve. Now, he doesn't immediately always say, okay, here it is, go. It might be in a year or two years or five years. But God is now some of you are already doing your ministry. You're mature and, and you've been you've been prepared and you're, you've already begun your ministry. But others of you haven't really begun. You're still preparing. Maybe you need to get going with some ministry. 
There was a very famous Scottish novelist called Sir Walter Scott who lived around 1771 to 1832. So around 1800 he was alive. And when Sir Walter Scott, he, he became a famous novelist and he wrote famous novels like Ivanhoe and um, Rob Roy, novels that sort of had a Scottish romantic twist to them. Um, I don't know much about it, maybe you know more than I do, brother, about Walter Scott, but he wrote these romantic Scottish novels, which I, I used to love the movies of Ivanhoe, Rob Roy, when I was a kid. When he was a little boy, he wanted to be a soldier. And, you know, he saw the soldiers with their uniforms. In those days, you know, they didn't have weapons of mass destruction. You just had to have your sword and you had to have martial art and skill. Uh, a bit like the, the, the warriors of uh, Luzon, right? You know, they, they were people of courage and you had to have skill to d defend your family and your lands from invaders. Well, the, the little boy saw this and he wanted to be a soldier. He wanted to grow up and wear the uniform and defend the king and country. But when he was a little boy, he had an injury and he became slightly lame. And so he was ineligible for military service. And because of his lameness, he spent a lot of time reading books. And so as a boy, he would read Scottish um, stories of, of Scottish uh, romances and Scottish history. Um, and uh, when, he was, when he'd become a famous author, an old man said of him, I can't, I can't do, I should do a Scottish accent because my ancestors were Scottish, but I can't do it, okay? So the, the old man said to him, he was making himself all the time, but he didn't ken maybe what he was about until years had passed. Let's say that again. The old man commented, when he was a boy, he was a making himself all the time, but he didn't ken what he was about until all the years had passed. In other words, all his childhood, when he was, he was injured and he, he couldn't run and play sports, he was preparing to be one of the great novelists um, of the uh, early uh, 19th century. So, and he had a great influence on European literature, I believe. So when I was in school, there was a boy called Peter. And Peter was one of these kids, you know, I, I, I was a kind of nerdy, uh, somewhat uncoordinated kid. Um, and I loved basketball, but wasn't really very good at it. And um, Peter was this guy who was super handsome and super athletic. And he was the captain of the first 11. And we went to a sort of good boys, English boys school, you know, and, and sports was everything, you know. And, and Peter was the captain of the first 11. And he was one of the rugby players. And he was cool and handsome. And in those days in the 70s, hardly anybody was Christian. I was a Christian. I'd become a Christian at 11. I'd encountered Christ and come to Christ. But that was very uncool. And Peter was very cool. He was an atheist like everybody else. But something happened to Peter. In a rugby game, he broke one of his legs really badly in multiple places. And Peter had to spend five months in hospital having r multiple surgeries. And during those five months in hospital, somebody brought him some Christian books to read. And, you know, after the first couple of weeks, people come and visit you, but then we all sort of forgot about him. And he was lying in his hospital bed for months, and he had nothing to do. So he read these Christian books. And my friend Peter, most unlikely convert in, I could imagine, gave his life to Jesus, reading in his hospital bed. Now, if he'd never broken his leg, he would never have had that experience of coming to faith in Christ. And years later, I was a missionary priest in Hong Kong, and I, I got an email from my old classmate, Peter, and he said, he said, you know, you, you might be surprised, but I'm also a pastor. I'm a Pentecostal pastor, and I'm serving in a church in, in Tasmania. And he said, we're bringing a mission team to Asia, and we'd like to come and visit your church and have a mission and preach in the church. So my childhood friend, most likely to be atheist, least likely to follow Jesus, ended up in my church in Hong Kong preaching the gospel. Isn't that amazing? And we renewed our childhood friendship this time because in the middle of year 12, I'd gone overseas to be an exchange student. I had never seen him since. He was in hospital, I think, when I went overseas. So I had never seen him. I'd never heard the story of what happened to Peter. I didn't even know he was a pastor. Isn't that amazing? And so all that time, how miserable it must have been for the, the captain of the first 11 to smash his leg to be unable to run, unable to play rugby, to be, and then, but he found Christ and God was preparing him for his life's work. And he was a beautiful Christian pastor with a lovely wife and, and children and just a lovely godly man. And God had used that, it, God had been preparing him. See, God is, God is preparing us. 
When I was young, uh, uh, in primary school, I wanted to be a pilot, a pilot flying planes. And in, in P6, we had to do these eye tests, you know, where you look at the color patterns and you're supposed to see a triangle or a square or the number 13 or something. And I couldn't see most of them. I couldn't really see anything. And they said, oh, you're colorblind, Stephen. And there are certain professions you can't do. And at the top of the list of professions that you can't do is pilot. You can't be a pilot. Because pilots have to be able to discern colors on the dashboard and the lights. And um, so I was a bit crestfallen. And then when I was in high school, I thought, well, I'd like to be a diplomat. I'd like to join the diplomatic corps. You know, it's not easy to get into foreign affairs department. And uh, I had the gift of the gab by the time I got into high school, senior high school. And I thought, well, you know, this would be great to be a diplomat. So when I got out of university and I graduated, the government had um, uh, a management trainee intake scheme where thousands and thousands, like 20,000 young people a year would apply for a small number of positions. And each government department would take three or four people. So literally, you know, out of 20,000, there might be five positions in foreign affairs to be trained for the diplomatic corps. And so I put my name in and I applied and I didn't make it. I wasn't the cream of the crop. I wasn't like it was the top half a percent who would, who would have a chance, you know. And I, I wasn't quite that bright. My brother would have been if he'd applied. But you had to have many qualities, not just intellectual. You had to have sporting achievements, your musical achievements. You know, they looked at the whole person. You had to be sort of Superman, basically. So I got, I got in, but I got into a lesser department. So I was really thrilled because I got a job and I became a government management trainee. And it was a great achievement for me and I was very happy. But I got into the Department of Administrative Services. So our job was purchasing. So, you know, we would purchase all the computers and the toilet rolls and the pens and, and, and everything that the government uses. Uh, and we had the police force. Uh, and we had these different, so our department was the kind of the lowest department. So I got in to a government job, but, which was a great job, but, and it was very well paid and it was very it was great success on my CV, but it wasn't foreign affairs, which was the top of the top. So I was colorblind, I couldn't be a pilot, I, was, I wasn't clever enough to be a diplomat, um, and, and so both of those aspirations were frustrated. The aspiration to see the world, to travel, the aspiration to be an ambassador, to, to speak on behalf of my country, these were frustrated. Um, and, and years later, I, I just was 16 and I wanted to get out of Dodge. And I saw on TV, the mother of a friend of mine had a current affairs program and they were advertising and talking about exchange programs for students. And there was an exchange program called AFS, the American Field Service. So I applied. And this time I got it, and I, I went to America as an exchange student, and I went because I wanted to get out of Dodge. I went because I wanted to escape from Canberra, which is like a big country town, and I wanted to see the world, and I wanted to experience life. So at the age of 16, my father didn't want to let me go. My father thought I was too young, because I was a year young for my form at school. And uh, he talked to the bishop, his boss. My dad was a priest too. And he said, oh, you know, Cecil, I, I don't think I should let Stephen go to be an exchange student. He's too young. And, and Cecil, for which I am forever grateful, the old Archbishop of Canberra said, well, David, when we were 16, we went off to fight the Nazis. <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Bishop. So my dad sort of scratched his head because he'd gone off. He was in the Empire. He was in the Air Force. And he'd flown, as I told you recently. So I was, he's like, okay, you can go. He let me go. So, and I, I just wanted to escape, you know. I wanted to get away from my parents and see the world. But you know, when I look back on all these things, God was preparing me. I had that international experience. I studied in Texas. I know what Texas is. I know what America is. I traveled to the UK. I understand a little bit about that. Um, I, I got to see different kinds of Christians in the world. Um, I, I got to travel. And if it hadn't been for those experiences, I never would have imagined applying for a job in Hong Kong for church planting. Never would have crossed my mind. But because I'd had these experiences of travel and international vocation, when God called me to China and called me to be a church planter in, in Asia, in China, I was ready because God had prepared me, you understand. So this is still the first point. Uh, don't worry, the other points are short. This is still the first point, but the point is that God is preparing you. He has been preparing you, and some of you are now in your ministry and you're doing it, 
others are still being prepared, but the things that happen in your life that seem like they're rubbish or they're bad or they're dangerous or they're hurtful, God will use them and he can use them for some good, for some purpose in the world. So first of all, there's preparation. We see this in the story. God is a God who prepares. He was preparing the coming of the Messiah by sending John. That's the first point. The second thing is, it says, um, you, my child, John, shall be called the prophet of the Most High. You will go before the Lord, that is Jesus, to prepare the way to give people knowledge of salvation. So that the second point is, God has sent us knowledge of salvation through Jesus. It's a simple fact that in the time of Christ, people didn't know what God was like. The Greeks and the Romans and the Gentiles imagined that God was kind of without passion, beyond joy and sorrow, looking on humanity in unmoved detachment, that God was other than us, the gods were other than us, and that there was a pantheon of gods. The Jews believed in Jehovah, but their understanding of Jehovah was mixed, and they seemed to be drawn to the idea of Jehovah as a judge, the God of law, the God of judgment, quite severe, like the idea of Yom Yahweh, the day of the Lord, being a day of terror and darkness. Um, not, and, you know, as the prophet says, don't long for the coming of the Lord. You will not be happy when the Lord comes. You'll be in trouble, basically, the prophet says. So the, the, the Gentiles had this idea of this passionless God, who, gods who could kind of care less about humanity. And then on the other hand, the Jews had this idea of, of Jehovah being the judge who was all about the law. Of course, the Old Testament also talks of the love of God, but they've kind of missed that a bit. And so when Jesus comes, he shows what God is like. As one little girl says, Jesus was God with skin on. So when you, when you talk to people, you say, well, what is God like? I know the answer to that. God was like Jesus. So it says um, that in the scripture that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So what is God like? God is love. God comes to us. Yes, he's the judge. Yes, he is um, transcendent and other than us. But the greatest truth about God is that he is our friend and brother who loves us. He is the lover of our souls. So Jesus introduced God to us as a lover, as a friend, as the one who loves us. This was mind-blowing to the ancient world. Now, we take it for granted. No, God is love. Religion is about love. But nobody thought of, thought of that in the ancient world. It was a revelation. So Christianity in Jesus is a revelation. Jesus reveals who God is to us. In Matthew 1.21, the angel says to, to Joseph, Mary will bear a son. And you will name him Jesus. Jesus means Savior, or he saves. The angel said, because he will save his people from their sin. So the second point and the second pattern in, in this prophecy uh, that Zechariah gives is that he will bring knowledge. Jesus will bring knowledge of salvation. In John chapter 14, I love to quote this verse. You've often heard me quote it. I love this exchange where Philip says to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father. Last night at youth group, we were talking about faith, and a little girl who's a newcomer said to me, prove it, you know, prove faith to me. Well, Philip said, show us the Father, you know, prove it. We want to see the Father, and then Philip says, we'll be satisfied. Prove it, and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus says to Philip, have I been with you all this time, and you still don't know me? It's so ironic. I love that. It's like, dude, you know, are you so stupid? I've been here turning water into wine, raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out demons. You still don't know me? Bringing you these beautiful words of grace. You still haven't figured it out, dummy? You know, this is what he's saying. Philip is saying, prove it to us. Show us the Father. The Father is sitting right in front of him. Jesus is the proof. He is the revelation of God. And he says, whoever has, he goes on, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? How can you say? He's saying, how can you be so dumb, dummy? He's saying, I've been sitting here all this time, you don't know me? How can you say, how can you be so slow? He says, show us the Father. This is what he would say to someone today. You say, prove it to me. 
What? When I came the first time, I was incarnate of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, uh, lived in, in, in the armpit of the Middle East in, in, in Israel, and uh, crucified by the Romans and raised from the dead. And I, I made sure it was documented more than any other event in ancient history. And my book is published more than any other book in the history of the world. And you still want me to prove it? What else do I need to do? Hello? What else do I need to do? And by the way, my coming was prophesied over 300 times and I fulfilled all of those prophecies in my life. And you have copies of the documents from before I was born. What else do I need to prove? He has come to give us knowledge of salvation. He has come to reveal to us that God is love. And then it goes on the third point. So first of all, he's preparing us for, to know him and to serve him. And secondly, he brings knowledge of salvation to us. So for us, we get to know Jesus. We get to know that he's our savior and we need to be saved. And thirdly, there is forgiveness of sins. So it says, to give people knowledge of salvation, bottom of page two, by the forgiveness of their sins. How do we receive salvation? We need to be forgiven. Our sins have made a barrier between us and God. We need to be reconciled with God by the forgiveness of sins. And forgiveness of sin is not free. It costs someone. If I do something really terrible and my wife forgives me, it's not free. It costs her tears and a broken heart or whatever it is. It's not easy for her, but she forgives me because she loves me and she's commanded to by Christ. I'm giving you an example. For instance, when we forgive someone, it's not easy. It's not free. It's costly. It costs something. And when people whose lives are broken have to be remade and mended, it's not easy. It's, not, it, 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 it's costly. So forgiveness is not free. And so Jesus has paid the price on the cross for our forgiveness, that we can be forgiven. We often think of forgiveness as the remission of a penalty. Oh, I, like a, a, a someone being generous and saying, oh, I let you off. It's not like that. There's no let off. There's no let off. There's a price to be paid. When we mess up in our lives, there's consequence. You live with the consequence of your sin. You cannot... As the song says, as sure saying, we cannot turn back time. Oh, if I could turn back time. Oh, if I could undo the sins I've committed in my life. Oh, if I could change history and set myself free in that way. But we cannot turn back time. There is no turning back time. We live with the consequence of our sin. So if forgiveness is not turn back time, your sins are forgiven. It's not just the remittance of a debt. Then what is it? So here's what it is. It's the restoration of a broken relationship. There's always the consequence of your sin. It's always there. It's in, in history. Now God forgets it. The Bible says He forgets it. He, he puts it away from Him as far as the East is from the West. He can do something you can't. You can't forget the sins done against you. You can't forget the hurts that are done to you. But He can. So you can do something God cannot do. However, it's not about that. It's about the restoration of a relationship. He wants to be in relationship with you. So the forgiveness of sins is about a relationship being renewed and healed. Okay? So first of all, this preparation. All your life, God is calling you. All your life, through all the ups and downs, God is preparing you to know Him and to serve Him. Secondly, there is knowledge of salvation. You come to understand that you have a Savior, that He has come to die for you on the cross. Thirdly, there is forgiveness of sin. We surrender, we pray the sinner's prayer, we ask Christ to forgive us, and we renew a relationship with God, many for the first time. And then we're, we're baptized as a symbol of that, the washing away of sin, and our new relationship in Christ. Okay? So this is the pattern of our life. This is what you need to do. You, it's happening in your life now. Many of you are here because you're on this road, on this journey. And fourthly and lastly... It goes on and it says, In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us. So we, our sins are forgiven. The light of God shines on our life to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Peace is shalom. Shalom is not an absence of conflict. It's not, peace is not just quiet life. Shalom means all of God's blessings. All of God's uh, blessings in our life. Good health, prosperity, uh, right relationship with God and others especially. To shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. So let's go back. Number one, there's preparation. Number two, 
this knowledge of salvation. You need to understand that you have a Savior and you need a Savior. Number three, we are saved by forgiveness of sins. That's the mechanism by which we are saved. But it's not just a remittance of the debt. It's the beginning of a new relationship. It's the restoration of a relationship with God. He is your heavenly Father. He longs to come home, you, you to come home to Him to embrace you. And lastly, there is uh, a walking in light and in the way of peace. So we then walk our Christian life and we walk through death into eternity, walking in the light and in the way of peace, to guide our feet into the way of peace. This is the fourth stage of the Christian life. And this is the fourth stage of the prophecy of the song. The Zechariah is saying the Messiah is coming to lead your life and your feet into the way of peace. The way of Shalom is the way of following Jesus. It's the way that leads to heaven. Today, you will be with me in paradise. It's walking in the way of peace. Now, God forbid anybody goes to paradise today. But one day, one day, you will come to that day when I pray, Jesus will whisper in your old ears, today, you will be with me in paradise. And that will be because he prepared you he saved you, he forgave you, and you chose to walk in his way of peace. Amen. Christ is King. Follow him. Next slide, please. Let us stand as we affirm our faith in the words of the Creed. It's time for the boys to return, boys and girls, so let's declare together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scripture. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. The reason we stand is that it's important. Next slide. We're going to join together in these responses for our intercessions as we say, Father, we pray for your holy Catholic church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for our Archbishop Andrew and for all bishops, priests and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all our leaders and for those who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. Indeed, we thank you, Lord, and praise you for the saints who have entered into joy. And let us pray for our needs and for those of others. And so as we come to break bread together, we remember that Jesus said, Come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We declare this confession together as we say, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed 
by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive what we have been, amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Hear these words of absolution. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. We'll move straight to the greeting of peace. Please stand for the greeting of peace. We are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. We're going to sing my new favourite song, King of Kings. Thank you, B. This is our offertory hymn.
What a wonderful song for Christ the King Sunday. Let us pray. Blessed be God forever. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All glory and honor, thanks and praise are yours now and always, Lord, Holy Father, mighty Creator, ever-living God. We give thanks and praise for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, foretold by prophets of old, who by his death on the cross that Good Friday and rising to new life on Easter Sunday has offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. He is the one who has declared for us the way of salvation and forgiveness of sins. Next slide. Therefore, with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. And now, Father, we pray that we who receive these your gifts of bread and wine, according to our Saviour's word, may be partakers of his body and his blood. For on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, his almighty Father, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup of wine, and again, giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins, and for the reconciliation of God and man. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. We declare together, Christ has died, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And we pray, sanctify these gifts by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son. We offer our prayer and praise, Father, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Blessing and honor and glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. As Jesus has taught us, um, if you're with your family, you can join hands with your family if you feel comfortable. As Jesus taught his disciples, we are confident to pray, Our Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We do not presume to come to this table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same God, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to be the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Dear friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. His body broken and his blood shed. Let us take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. As always, if you are not baptized yet, we invite you to come up for a blessing. You need to be baptized in order to receive the bread and wine. If you haven't been baptized, you're not supposed to receive the bread and wine. It's a privilege of having been baptized, becoming a Christian. So if you're not baptized, you can cross your hand on your chest and come up for a blessing. Please teach your children what to do. The children should either be like this or like this. If, you've been, if they've been baptized, they can receive and put their hands out. If they've not been baptized, they should they do like this, okay? So please prepare the children what to do. Thank you.
you, dear friends, for your patience today. As always, I'd like to thank all the Sunday school teachers for their wonderful work, especially uh, as they're preparing for the Nativity play. We're very excited and looking forward to that time. Hear the word of the Lord this morning from, as we close out our service, we're reminded again of the words of the cross. The thief replied, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let us pray as we give thanks for these mysteries. We declare together, eternal God, heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love now and forevermore. Amen. Let's close as we sing, crown him with many crowns. As we have the church here.